Okay, everyone, um, thanks very much for um, attending tonight on a um, damp, old, rainy night, summer night. Um, so for everybody here at Clyde Road and obviously on the webcast, you're more than welcome to our uh, the Energy Environment Division's eighth lecture of the season and our final one for this particular season. Um, for those in Clyde, Clyde Road, I'd ask maybe if you could turn your phones off and switch them to silent. We have a couple of emergency exits at the back and at the side, and there should be an attendance sheet either at the door or, or going around you can sign that first please. Um, tonight's presentation is titled Towards Energy Self-Sufficient Wastewater Treatment for Ireland and will be presented by Dr. Carla Dusan. Um, so Carla is currently studying, uh, sorry, is currently an IRC postdoctoral scholar at NUI Galway. Her current research is related to the kinetic and process modelling of pyrolysis and gasification of biomass and waste for syngas and biomethane production. She has been part of several EU and regional, uh, regional projects investigating chemical production, chemicals production from renewable resources and energy recovery from wastes. And Carla obtained her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at the National University of Columbia in Bogota. Um, for those online, I'm going to give you an email address you can send any queries through. That's engineerswebcast at gmail.com. That's engineerswebcast at gmail.com. And we do a Q&A following Carla's presentation. So thank you, Carla. So good evening to everyone and thank you for coming today and to Engineers Ireland for hosting the pre this presentation. Um, today I will be presenting some of a, uh, an overview of a, a EPA funded uh, a research project related on the, um, uh, improving the cell sufficiency in terms of energy in wastewater treatment plants here in Ireland. Um, I will just start with a brief introduction uh, um, related to the state of the wastewater treatment sector and waste management, wa waste management in Europe and the Irish context and some of the objectives and methodologies apply within our EPA project, some fundamentals on thermal conversion uh, for gasification and combustion, and some of the results and funding, uh, uh, findings from, from our activities, as well as a, a just a brief overview of other applications uh, that, we, we, that we have been looking into uh, within the same uh, context. Now, just uh, just uh, to refer you back, uh, we are part of a, of a small uh, research, research group uh, in NOI Galway within the mechanical engineering department uh, and we are focused on, on uh, the study of thermal energy research based on efficiency, the conver conversion of energy and then use application of uh, renewable and conventional solid gas and uh, liquid fuels, uh, combustion, gasification and pyrolysis as well as applications of combined heat and power generation and even uh, thermal comfort in the built environment, all related to process and systems modeling mainly. Um, so just uh, for, for if you are interested in knowing more about uh, our activities, you can, um, you, can re uh, re uh, you can refer to our, our website of, uh, in our research group. Now, uh, the wastewater treatment infrastructure in, in Europe, um, it serves a population of over 500 million people um, using different levels of, uh, of uh, wastewater treatment depending on the locations of the sites, um, the um, location of the sites, the population, uh, the population that they serve to, um, as well as some environmental requirements for, for, uh, um, for those uh, places in which they are located. For instance, depending on the types of, uh, of water bodies that they serve, they, they require more stringent or less stringent treatments. Um, and here we, we have, uh, we see a representation of uh, the urban wastewater treatment distribution all over Europe, um, the, the different levels that they, that they apply to. So for instance, the, uh, the I just noticed this is uh, not uh, the updated version of my presentation, but it's fine. The yellow one um, represents primary treatment, so uh, mechanical and sedimentation, while the green one represents um, secondary treatment or biological treatment, and the cyan color represents uh, a more advanced uh, treatment, for instance, uh, implying nutrient removal and, and other levels of, of uh, purification. This, this type of uh, plants uh, um, consume in average or, uh, uh, yeah, in average be within, uh, between 20 and 45 kilowatts hour per equivalent person every year 
depending then on the level of the treatment that they uh, carried out, the type of technologies that they apply, the process operation, and as well the level of treatment of this loss and is then used or disposed of. <coughs> to improve energy efficiency within these wastewater treatment plants, they carried out different processes or they have different strategies, including bench benchmarking and audit processes to compare the operation and control of, the, of, uh, of, of different plants. Um, in, 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 in um, carrying out the uh, energy savings or implementing energy savings ba based on the upgrade or changes in the aeration systems for biological treatment, uh, improving the management of pumping stations, and as well improving co process control in view of seasonal changes within the flux or the influence the uh, water and the quality of the wastewater that they treat. However, most of the of the improvements in this uh, in the energy efficiency is uh, related to energy recovery within the, within the the facilities, um, relying on the on the use, for instance, of a te of technologies such as anaerobic digestion for the production of biogas and uh, and heat and power generation from from this uh, from this gas fuel. Uh, implementing this type of a strategy is uh, countries that. Uh, uh, wastewater treatment plants in, in countries such as Switzerland and Aus Austria has been able to have been able to reduce uh, over 30 percent of energy uh, demands of the sites, uh, leading to cost savings of over a million um, euro every year. Now, um, this uh, this um, facilities then produce over uh, 14 million tons of uh, of sewage loss every year as well in proportions that are um, directly related to the population size of the sites that they serve, as well as the level of, uh, of uh, treatment that they provide, and also in view of changes and uh, um, an implementation of more stringent, di stringent directives for the treatment of the wastewater. Uh, some of the treatment of this slush then is carried out through different technologies, including composting, um, land spreading on agricultural land, incineration and land spreading um, and land filling, for instance, although the, the last one has been um, banned in most uh, European countries and replaced mo most popularly by uh, land spreading on, on agricultural land. We can notice as well that some of the countries that have reported the highest efficiencies in, in wastewater management um, rely as well I in a great uh, extension on, uh, on uh, um, thermal conversion such as incineration as we see for Germany, um, the Netherlands, Austria, and Switzerland. Although uh, the use of or the implementation of incineration is not directly, uh, most, of the most of the time is not directly related to energy efficiency, but other concerns that I will mention later. Now in Ireland, uh, we count with over 530 wastewater treatment plants uh, with uh, much more need for improvements in terms of energy management and, and optimization. Energy consumptions in our sites have been reported to be of over 35 up to 60 kilowatt uh, per person equivalent every year, um, which are morely, mostly distributed in the aeration systems for, for biological treatment, counting for, over, or for up to 75% of the energy consumed, and as well on uh, slush treatment count, uh, accounting for 40% of the total energy consumed of these sites. <coughs> The national inventory of uh, slush generation um, indicates that we produce about or over 53,000 tons of uh, dry sewage slush every year. Um, and we count with only uh, 18 uh, slush treatment sites that rely on anaerobic digestion for the, for this, the, for the management of this waste. Um, in total, all these sites account for a total capacity of 3.9 million of PE. Um, of PE. Now, not all these sites are currently active. As we can see, uh, a total of 13 sites from these 18 are, are in operation today. And only 13 of these sites as well uh, count with uh, combined heat and power generation systems for energy recovery on site. So they are not in optimal operation, uh, not completely. Now, <coughs> um, these uh, anaerobic digestion facilities uh, process uh, about 50% of the total uh, sewage loss generated in wastewater treatment plants in Ireland, with uh, um, technologies following after this, uh, including uh, line treatment, composting, and drying. Now, the, the objective of these technologies is not to eliminate the slush, but rather make it, uh, make it suitable for application on agricultural land, 
by um, rendering rendering the biodegradable matter in a way that won't generate the odors or um, or contaminate or um, bring some biological risks into into the use of uh, in agriculture. So these uh, technologies don't reduce the volume uh, of the slush to a great extent. For instance, anaerobic digestion can eliminate only or can convert only 40 to 70 percent of the of the biodegradable matter in the slush to biogas. Um, to biogas. So it's not it's not an ultimate uh, uh, waste management system. Um, so and after all these treatments, including the anaerobic digestion and thermal drying, lime treatment, and composting, 96% uh, of the total slush is ultimately used uh, in agriculture uh, on land that is used for for food crops. So what are the main concerns related to these? We have first um, uh, organic pollutants or biological risks, which are overcome with the implementation of anaerobic digestion, as well as other uh, treatments that reduce these risks. For instance, um, 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 <laughs> sorry, um, pasteurization and as well as thermal drying. So these eliminate this type of of, uh, of components, uh, reducing then their 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 effects on land. But they imply as well some treatment and transportation costs uh, um, because these are most of the time energy intensive uh, uh, technologies and then they don't reduce completely the amount of the material. So we will have as well a high, high, wet con uh, high moisture content material to transport uh, back to the land when it's applied. Now there are other concern concerns that are not uh, looked into so much, uh, including the presence of heavy metals that can contaminate water bodies through runoff or leaching as well as uh, uptake in plants and animals um, by consumption or by the pr their presence in, in the soil. And there is also concerns uh, in terms of line land availability. So uh, there is so much that uh, can be applied on, on soil um, in, in, in the country. So this, this type of risks are normally controlled through the CO slush directive from the European Union which limits then the, the, the application rates of the, of the sewage slush and the quality that, um, that these materials may have. For instance, a maximum concentration of, of, uh, of metals, uh, copper, cadmium, and others that can um, involve risks for human, animal, and plant um, development. So in, uh, it, is, it is in our best interest to uh, find alternative ways in order to um, overcome these problems that are of an environmental type and that, that can also bring benefits in terms of energy efficiency and energy recovery for the wastewater treatment sector. In this sense, uh, combustion and gasification are technologies that are very attractive and that constitute an ultimate uh, waste volume reduction um, method. They can uh, um, um, eliminate almost completely the organic matter of the, of the sewage loss and then provide um, gas components or gas products that uh, can, from which we can recover energy to be used on site. So as I mentioned before, incineration or combustion is, uh, is already uh, very popular in some of the European countries that can, pr uh, which, are, which process today over 30% of the sewage slush through, through these uh, technologies, although gasification is still in, um, in, in its uh, exploration and development state. Within this context, we wanted to uh, evaluate how feasible wo it was to, um, to implement these thermal conversion technologies within our wastewater treatment plants um, to process either slush, or the CO slush directed without a anaerobic digestion treatment or the digestates coming out from, from these uh, biological treatment. For that, for uh, accomplishing this, we created, uh, we wanted to create a, a practical Model, modeling tool that could uh, describe uh, the, the efficiency of the thermal conversion stage uh, for these very specific materials. And we wanted to evaluate how well can be integrated the thermal conversion technologies with the anaerobic digestion uh, within the current capabilities of, of the wastewater treatment sector. Um, now gasification is a very attractive technology uh, for the conversion of, uh, in general, of biomass and waste materials, they they convert then a solid, a solid uh, carbon-rich uh, uh, fuel into uh, a fuel gas. 
in a process that is normally carried out in a fluid aspect reactor. In this type of, uh, of, of system of reactor, we have, uh, we mobilize the biomass with a fluidiza uh, fluidization agent or a gasification agent then the, um, at a certain temperature, then, uh, um, then leading to a sequence of different reactions that convert the solid into a gas fuel, uh, starting by uh, uh, drying the solids and uh, volatilizing the, the material, followed by oxidation to provide a certain, uh, a certain amount of energy, uh, energy within the bath, and later some other reforming and charge conversion reactor, uh, reactions that uh, ultimately produce the fuel gas. So the initial material is rendered into a fuel gas mixture and an ash, uh, and a stabilized ash material um, that is, uh, is dry and, uh, and is in a purely inorganic in, in its own. Um, so this, this type of reactor system is, uh, provides very, uh, high flexibility in uh, terms of uh, utilizing different types of, of solid fuels either uh, when they have very low um, uh, energy density in particular, which is one of the uh, largest pro problems with uh, biomass. And they can provide then uh, conversions of over 80% of the organic matter and produce an stable ash. Then um, as well, we have a fuel gas mixture uh, or a syn gas, which is rich in uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen which can be later used as a fuel uh, directly in combined heat and power uh, generation systems or uh, in chemical synthesis to uh, produce synthetic natural gas. And another important advantage is that this type of, of system provides an opportunity for heat integration and heat recovery within a plant. Now in, the, um, in describing and optimizing this type of processes, there are two different approaches. Um, in one, we have advanced uh, reaction kinetics and transport, uh, transport uh, models in which uh, we know in detail and describe in detail each of the um, phen uh, phenomena occurring uh, within the process. Although these type of methodologies are very complex, um, data is, uh, the, da the experimental data is not uh, readily available, especially for non-conventional materials such as the CH slush. It is also computationally expensive, but it, it is accurate. On the other hand, we have thermodynamic equi equilibrium tool in which we um, work under the premise that the material uh, and, and the reacting mixture uh, achieves uh, thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium coupled with some global heat and mass balances. This uh, methodology is mu much more simpler, sorry, simpler. Um, for this, we have uh, enough level of detail in terms of data that we require. Uh, it's computationally inexpensive, although it's not as accurate as the mo mo most advanced techniques. In improving uh, the accuracy of these simple, simple um, uh, uh, methods, we uh, incorporate some empirical data that informs the limitations in terms of reaction ki kinetics and transport phenomena within uh, the real reactors. So this is commonly in form in terms of the conversion of um, the carbon conversion accomplished in, in the reactor. So how much residual carbon is left uh, after the reaction, uh, as well uh, how much of undesirable product products or tars are produced uh, within the reactor and the amount of methane that is found in the seen gas at the end of the process. Uh, if we inform ourselves uh, about these three components, based on empirical data um, that can be connected to conditions in the, in the gasifier, such as temperature, equivalence ratio, and so on. We can then um, subtract this, uh, this, these products and then uh, allow the remaining uh, material or the remaining fuel to achieve uh, chemical equilibrium and then obtain a picture, a complete uh, and more accurate picture of, of the distribution of products at the end of the process. Now, um, in in uh, in gasification, we have two important or three important uh, uh, operational parameters. We have temperature, we have the equivalence ratio, which is an indication of the amount of uh, o oxidizing agent that we use, air, either air or, or oxygen, and re residence time. If we uh, consider that the reactor is designed in a way that the residence time is enough to accomplish the a kinetically limited uh, conversion, 
We can then relate the equivalence ratio and temperature to these type of properties, including carbon conversion or the methane concentration. So we collected data uh, from different fluidized bed reactors um, and different types of uh, biomass materials and tried to observe if there was a, um, a direct rela relation and created some very simple um, um, regression um, regressions that relate this, uh, this type of responses with the operational conditions. Once we have restricted then um, and created the model based on, on these premises, we uh, validated the, the data that we can generate through the model uh, by comparing the uh, gas composition of the seen gas and the quality of the seen gas produced. We observed in general, in here we, say we see uh, results, experimental results and model results uh, from air gasification and steam gasification systems of different types of biomasses. And we in general observed that there was a satisfactory description of the carbon distribution among carbon dioxide and carbon uh, uh, monoxide. However, the hydrogen concentration was uh, most of the time uh, over, over estimated due to the assumptions of, the, of reaching the um, chemical equilibrium within, within the process. However, when applying this type of uh, process uh, into combined heat and power generations, we are most interested in the heating value or the energy content of the thin gas. So this is another property that is of our interest. And when describing the, the quality of the thin gas in terms of energy, uh, energy content, we observed that the model uh, was satisfactory in describing this property. Um, this property. Uh, this was attributed mostly to an offset of energy between the, the hydrogen and, and, methane, um, uh, and methane in the composition of the thin gas. Although not a perfect tool, was was uh, deemed satisfactory to the moment for for this application. And then in the in the next level of the analysis, we uh, selected different scenarios for for the comparison of the systems. We started uh, by considering as a um, as a base case scenario uh, an anaerobic digestion only. And then we later uh, analyzed the application of combustion or air gasification as thermal conversion technologies, and then an integration of these two uh, for the treatment of, of the slush. We also consider three different combined heat and power generation systems depending on the technology, um, on the thermal conversion technology that was implemented. <laughs> now with the heuristic factors and uh, some thermodynamic analysis, we created a modeling tool in MATLAB to describe uh, performance indicators of the system that uh, accounted for uh, how much of the energy demands uh, the, um, the in implementation of the thermal conversion could, uh, could cover, um, as well as effects on the carbon footprint of the operation of the plant and, uh, and the, the level of uh, costs that they would imply or um, achieve. Now this is a representation of, of, of the systems that we compare. We started with the anaerobic digestion only system. We applied the, the study or the, the case uh, study to a uh, wastewater treatment plant of a uh, treating uh, with a capacity of 1,600,000 PE, generating then uh, 130 tons of dry sloughs per day, uh, which is of a very similar capacity as uh, observing the rings and uh, wastewater treatment plant here in Dublin. And then we considered that uh, the slot generated in, in the different levels of treatment was used uh, through, it uh, was converted to anaerobic digestion. The biogas then uh, converted to energy and heat uh, through a THP model uh, containing a, um, a combustion engine. And then the digested later dried uh, for final uh, use or disposal. In the second, uh, in the second scenario then we, we saw, we see we observe the, we consider the thermal conversion directly. So we use the a slush, the dewater slush, we dry it, and then we com either combust it or gasify it. Um, by, and later implemented different uh, stages of heat recovery, gas treatment for, for the, the use, for instance, of the same gas in the CHP module, and the final flue gas treatment when, it, when levels, for instance, of sulfur or nitrogen, right, nitrogen in, the, in the gas effluent w were high. <coughs> and then later, we observed the integration of AD and thermal and thermal conversion. So, first the anaerobic digestion was carried out, and then the digestives were dried and either 
uh, and later gasified or combusted following a similar distribution of process as, as considered for the thermal conversion only scenarios. So in, uh, for their comparison, we took into account um, so an energy efficiency in terms or represented by the level of um, coverage of electricity and heat demands within the plant. So a, a simple ratio of how much energy was generated or recovered and how much energy was required in the operation of both the slush, uh, the slush treatment hub and the wastewater treatment plant. We also look into economic indicators, so cost of the treatment or cost of, of operation, the levelized cost of electricity that was generated and in, uh, the level of investment for the different systems. And then the carbon footprint as well uh, as represented uh, of uh, equivalent, uh, carbon equivalent per, ta uh, per ton of dry slush. <coughs> now, within our model, so uh, we will go through some of the results that, that we obtained. Within our model, we uh, consider, we took into account the effects of the anaerobic digestion on the quality of the, of the sewage slush. For instance, anaerobic digestion reduces the energy content of the material and enriches as well the amount of inorganics that are found in the slush, which is uh, not desirable for, uh, from the thermal conversion point of view. Uh, and we, but we consider this in order to make more realistic the scenario in the in of the, or the analysis in within the model. Um, and then we, we analyze two main parameters, parameters um, and their effect on the thermal conversion um, performance. These two parameters were the, the moisture content of the, of the slush or the digested that was entering to the, to the gasifier and the equivalence ratio that was, um, that was uh, used uh, within the reactor. So the amount of oxidant that was used for the reaction. Um, we, uh, for instance, we will see here first the, the gasification temperature that can be achieved in, in the operation of this process, of the gasification process we there. So the higher the value of the equivalence ratio is, the lower the concentration of the ox oxidant that is used. Um, in that sense, the low, the, with the lower amount uh, of oxygen that we use, the, the temperatures that are achieved are, are much lower. So with the, when we approach a low value of, of the equivalence ratio, we are nearer to an operation in a combustion regime. Similarly, the higher the, the, the uh, moisture content in the slush is, the lower the temperature, the temperature that we can achieve within, within the reactor due to uh, the effect of the, of the moisture content um, which requires to be dry within within the process. We can we can also um, see the effects of these two parameters on the quality of the seen gas, that is, the heating value um, of the of the gas fuel. And we observe as well that the higher uh, equivalence ratios we uh, increase the the energy content of the fuel. Um, with the moisture content having uh, a milder effect on on this property. Uh, um, within the gasifying, uh, the gasifier performance. Now, um, this uh, this can be summarized by uh, analyzing the coal gas efficiency, which is a ratio of the energy in the gas fuel to the energy in the solid fuel. So, how much e energy was entering to the reactor and how much energy we are obtaining in the form of a suitable gas fuel. Um, so. We can we can then observe uh, how a low uh, sorry high equivalence ratio and low moisture contents Im improve the efficiency of the gasification stage. This is uh, this uh, these two parameters have other consequences uh, in the whole system. For instance, the moisture content the lower the moisture content of the material that is entering to the gasifier uh, will will require a higher demand for the thermal drying stage. Um, and thus a high penalty for the overall system. Similarly, when we operate at a high equivalence ratio, we will, uh, we will be requiring a higher amount of energy for operating the gasification stage. So these effects can be translated or can be observed in overall in the coverage, in the level of uh, energy coverage that we achieved um, considering that we connect uh, the, uh, the sink gas to a combustion engine as uh, for, for the CHP application. So in here we observe the uh, coverage of heat 
for the system. So that is all the all the heat that we were recovering from all uh, high temperature gas effluents and uh, the energy required for the operation of, of the wastewater treatment plant and the operation of each of the stages uh, involved in the thermal conversion, for instance, thin, thin gas treatment and flue gas treatment as well. Uh, we observed that then for uh, uh, ac uh, accomplishing co uh, a coverage higher than 100% that is producing a surplus or uh, recovering a surplus of heat, we require to operate with, uh, with high uh, moisture contents or with a lower um, uh, to a lower extent of the of the drying stage of the of the sewage slush. As well, we require to be operating at low equivalence ratios. That is, a combustion or a combustion uh, regime in the thermal conversion is more favorable in order to maximize a uh, heat uh, recovery. In terms of uh, power efficiency or power coverage, we observe that all the opposite conditions are are beneficial. So we are preferring a high to intermediate equivalence ratios and low moisture content in, all, in order to maximize the production of a high uh, energy content seen gas fuel that, that improves the, the operation of the combustion engine. Now, the, the four different scenarios that we consider with the different CHP technologies uh, um, included combustion connected to a steam cycle Gasifi gasification connected to a boiler that will combust the steam gas and, uh, and generate the steam for the steam cycle. Uh, gasification and, uh, and an IC engine fed with the steam gas and gasification and a gas turbine. Each of these uh, combination of technologies are, have different sets of suitabilities for this application. For instance, incineration is highly suitable for managing a very dirty material as, as a slush. Um, while uh, gasification facilitates the, the use of, of uh, or is, uh, is appropriate with the use of, of, of um, flexible technologies that can use a low, a, a low energy fuel. Now, the thin gas, as we saw, um, produced from a material such as sewage slush doesn't have a high energy content, which make it difficult, for instance, in, a, in using it for gas turbines. Um, but they can be, but the other technologies can be adapted for this type of, of material. Also, gasification and, and technologies such as uh, IC engine or the or or the gas turbine ha implies high costs of uh, installation, um, as well as high power and heat recovery efficiencies. Now, the the steam cycle systems uh, relying on boilers have a higher uh, opportunity for recovering here heat than for generating uh, power as well. So they, they provide different, different advantages depending on the levels of requirements of the wastewater treatment plant and of the thermal conversion technology for the slush. In here, we summarize then uh, these four scenarios and the combined AD and thermal conversion scenarios in a way that we can observe the, the both the heat, the heat coverage and the electricity coverage that they provide. So we, we observe the thermal conversion, so each of the systems that I was mentioning before, um, represented with the TC, thermal conversion, or the combined scenarios that consider anaerobic digestion and the thermal conversion. In this figure, in this figure then, we, we would like to go towards a technology that can provide both uh, a, um, electricity and heat recovery coverage, uh, coverages above, uh, above 100%, so that we have energy surpluses both in terms of heat and, and electricity, while uh, technologies uh, on, the, on the lower side of the, of the diagram will, will require an, an external so source, a uh, fossil-based so source of energy. So to start is uh, the base case scenario. This one, this, uh, these different examples vary depending on the efficiency of the biogas conversion, which varies as well depending on the quality of the, of the sewage slush. So they can report uh, between 100 and 400 um, cubic meters of methane per, per ton, of, um, per ton of, of sewage slush. And depending on this, well, they can uh, report efficiencies that, that lead to coverage, uh, to a full coverage of, of electricity within the plant with, low, with a low uh, heat integration opportunity. 
Now, the combustion, the combustion system, depending on the conditions in which it is uh, is provided, it can offer high heat recover, uh, heat recovery with, with a low or, or a low supply of electricity, lower than 50% of the total requirements or demands on the site. Now, combining gasification with uh, with uh, the combustion and the steam cycle, we see that we uh, actually obtain lower efficiencies in terms of electricity recovery due to the additional demands of the gasifier. And then we have uh, the gasification and uh, um, internal combustion engine and gas turbine. These scenarios increase then the both the recovery of power, uh, uh, the generation of power and the recovery of heat. And in particular, the scenario with the combustion engines can provide uh, opportunities in which both uh, the total heat and electricity demands are covered. When we combine anaerobic digestion and thermal conversion, we observe that these, uh, the, the performance of all the systems are um, significantly improved, and this is due to the highly high selectivity in the chemical conversion of the anaerobic digestion. The AD provides a fuel that is uh, um, that has a higher energy content, thus improving the efficiency, the overall efficiency of the performance in the system. <coughs> um, we wanted to compare as well how far uh, the the technologies um, bear uh, in comparison to uh, typical AD and CHP plants. So these. Uh, for plants that go from 20 kilowatt to 2 megawatt uh, electricity, they they report operational costs that go from 80 to 150 uh, euro per ton of, of of biological material. While thermal conversion technologies uh, reported values uh, slightly higher than than within that range. However, at a, at a higher uh, total energy coverage or higher energy efficiency than the AD only scenarios. The addition or the combination of the AD with the, with the thermal conversion then improved, maintained, or didn't affect uh, significantly the costs of operation and increased then the energy coverage of, of the system. Now, the levelized cost of electricity for this order of AD plants, we also uh, we observed the costs that go from 5 to 50, about 50 uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the thermal conversion systems, uh, only the gas turbine or the or the um, or the combustion engine provided the scenarios in which these uh, values could be also achieved, and then similarly the combination of AD and thermal conversion um, expanded or improved the electricity coverage and provided the with the slight savings in the in the um, cost of uh, uh, generation of electricity. Now for uh, analyzing the impacts on the carbon footprint, we um, estimated what were the normal, the, the normal uh, carbon emissions that were reported for the, ba for the, for the case study. So we estimated that for, for the wastewater treatment plant counting with AD and drying of the slush, with no energy recovery, we can be uh, observing um, carbon emissions of the order of 550 a kilogram of CO2 per ton of the slush that is generated, uh, reducing it uh, uh, um, to or to about to, uh, 300 um, kilogram per ton when energy recovery is implemented. And then we observed that the thermal conversion technologies were reporting similar um, similar carbon emissions as this best case scenario. With AD and uh, thermal conversion, the integration of these two technologies improving and reducing further the, the carbon footprint to, to uh, about 100 uh, kilograms of CO2 per, per ton of slush. Now, um, it is the, the economy of the scale of these applications, in particular thermal conversion, is very important, um, especially when we want to achieve a profitable and sustainable system of waste to energy. Um, we can op we can analyze these opportunities from two perspectives. One would be uh, as a waste management system, so that we we would like to uh, to obtain a technology that has a low uh, a low level of treatment cost, or a system that I is uh, defined for power generation. So we want to achieve low levelized cost of energy in energy production. So. 
We compare here two extremes of, of the opportunities that we can have with thermal conversion. So one is incineration with energy recovery and gasification and combustion enzymes. Um, for, for the perspective of, of uh, electricity generation, we see that uh, high or large, uh, large sizes or large capacities of the plant are desired in order to minimize the cost of electricity generation uh, reaching values of, uh, of 26 cents per kilowatt hour for, for the gasification based, sy based system and 52 cents per kilowatt hour for the combustion system. So uh, a large, uh, large facility is important. For the perspective of the waste management or the uh, operation costs, we see, however, that the combustion or incineration opportunity is more flexible and can be operated at, a, at lower sizes than uh, gasification can, can be. So like if we have a plant of less than uh, 20 tons per day, um, combustion costs uh, uh, are more, are more uh, are preferable uh, in comparison to, to gasification. This also um, um, gave us the, the idea or, 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 the, um, or made us realize the importance of, of a centralized scheme for for treatment of waste uh, can be beneficial for the management of sewage sludge. So we will be looking into um, decentralized treatment and collection of the sewage sludge, and uh, and then thermal conversion in a in a large facility, uh, um, implementing all these um, uh, available materials. From that uh, perspective, as well, co-processing with other wastes uh, can provide opportunities to improve efficiency to improve as well or to reduce the, um, the occurrence of, of some uh, technical problems in the operation of, of gasification plants and, uh, and also bring benefits in terms of, of, uh, of um, producing energy that is uh, renewable. Um, so thinking about this uh, decentralized um, uh, treatment sites, uh, we have been working in collaboration with UCC um, in the, within the Marai Research Center in a project funded by Gas Networks Ireland that is looking into uh, centralized plants for the production of biomethane through anaerobic digestion. And we are, imp we are looking into implementing thermal conversion technologies to improve uh, the performance of the operation of these sites, so reducing the carbon and energy footprint of uh, biomethane production sites uh, based on the utilization of, of waste materials in Ireland. <coughs> So this is just an example. I just will go briefly uh, through this. Um, for instance, in previous work uh, by them, they have proposed uh, the implementation of different sites along the along the um, natural gas network of, of the country. Um, these sites will be collecting uh, food food waste or brown bean waste uh, from different electoral divisions and uh, will be uh, then treated through anaerobic digestion then upgraded to biomethane and injected to the green. What we are looking into is utilizing the digest, the digest state that is left after the anaerobic digestion, and instead of using it for, for land spreading, uh, using it for, pr for producing uh, heat and power that is required for the operation of these sites. There is some limitations, for instance, in terms of, of the food, uh, food, uh, food waste digest state on land which is mainly the requirement of some very, uh, some very energy intensive treatments such as pasteurization. And so um, thermal conversion can be attractive uh, for, for this type of application. Mm. So in general, we are, we are, we are comparing a, a system in which we are uh, collecting, collecting the food waste, uh, treating it on site, then converting it to biogas and digestate through anaerobic digestion um, then treating the biogas and separating the biomethane and injecting it to the grid. And then the digested is either uh, treat, um, treated through the water and thermal drying to be land spread on land, uh, involving the transportation of these digestates back to their uh, points of origin, uh, or either use it for gasification on site. That gasification then has its own, its, its own components very similar to what we were analyzing in the previous uh, cases for wastewater treatment. So we had the allothermal uh, gasification, the production of uh, thin gas, and then an ash waste that will be required to be transported to a disposal site. Um, then the thin gas is treated um, to make it suitable for use in a combustion engine. 
uh, and then the heat and power generated from the CHP s system is uh, is used for providing energy required in the pretreatment of the of the food waste and anaerobic digestion in all the stages of the upgrade of the of the anaerobic digestion and most importantly in the dewatering and thermal drying of the digester, which is a very energy intensive and ex a step. So. Um, so this, uh, this study is looking to uh, the, the existence of, of, a pot of five potential uh, uh, food waste treatment plants, uh, providing about between nine and 12, with a capacity between nine and 12 uh, megawatts of biomethane. And we have observed that uh, cost of, uh, or energy involved in the transportation of the digested back to the electoral division is is greatly reduced from over se 70 kilowatt to less than two kilowatt um, for if we transport uh, only the ash to uh, the, the residual ash to disposal site. We also see that energy and carbon footprint are reduced by, by up to 50% and we provide an opportunity of heat integration. So when, when, no <coughs> when no gasification or thermal conver conversion of the digester is implemented, over 50% of the biomethyl that is produced would be required to meet the heat demands of the digested treatment. When we implement gasification, then we can provide um, uh, about 15% of these heat requirements and produce uh, an energy swap loss uh, above 10%. Um, in the future, we will be also looking into incineration and other type of technologies, as well as involving the recovery of, of nutrients from the ash, the residual ash, which is a very important component in making this system sustainable as well. So to summarize, um, just want to, to uh, highlight the importance of energy recovery and how these technologies can provide scenarios in which um, a total coverage of the energy demands of wastewater treatment sites uh, can be achieved. And uh, the opportunities that integrating anaerobic digestion with thermal conversion can provide in improving the energy efficiency of the sites. So these technologies are competitive, although they require heavy, heavy investments which, which uh, indicates that going towards large centralized plants uh, is the way to go in, in their implementation. We can also see the opportunity in reducing the carbon footprint of this sector and making more sustainable the wastewater treatment systems. And uh, in, in future work, we are looking into implementing uh, the economies of scale and evaluating systems, um, schemes of uh, waste collection and centralized thermal conversion for energy recovery. So these will hi uh, these uh, collection systems will rely on a on an optimal on-site treatment in order to reduce volume and uh, and minimize the transportation costs and uh, the carbon footprint that they bring into the into the overall system. So, thank you. <laughs> Microphone. Nope. Hello. Um, okay, Carla, thanks to a million for a very interesting, very detailed presentation. A lot of figures behind that, a lot of good conclusions. Um, if I might open to the floor at this stage, is there any questions? Anybody? Sure. Maybe if I could just kick one off. Um, I don't actually work in this area myself, but am I right in saying that land spreading is being phased out throughout Europe, that there's a, a move uh, to, to remove that? Conditions are very diverse uh, at the moment. Uh, for instance, Germany, um, Austria, they are very focused on, on incineration, no land spreading, because of, of those risks uh, uh, involved in, in heavy metals uh, yeah. pollution. Uh, other countries have uh, like Italy, France, they are more towards land spreading because it's more economical. Okay. It's beneficial for agriculture in terms of it's something cheap and available that is there and that can be used for that. Yeah. So the in, in, in terms of that, the, the CO2 loss directive is, is trying to lim limit those type of problems by giving these uh, good practice indications of how much um, uh, heavy metals you can allow on, on the land and so on. There has been as well some uh, surveys from the European Union Commission uh, on um, on the amount of heavy metals uh, present at the moment on, on in the soils of different countries. 
like as far as I'm aware, for instance, uh, Ireland fares very well in terms of uh, of, uh, of copper, and cadmium, and so on. But there are, uh, for some of them, they are within the recommendable limits of concentration. So um, they might be like there is a risk of going beyond the levels that are recommended. But uh, as far as I know, it's not something that is of major concern in Ireland at the moment. So. Carla, Jerry Duggan, Irish Academy of Engineering, and I'm relying on data I looked at 30 years ago now, so my memory might be failing slightly. But my memory at that stage is looking at the um, input to various, uh, all of the sewage treatment plants that were, where data was available in Ireland at that stage. The only plant I can remember that had any sort of a serious heavy, heavy metal problem was Listole, and I'm checking it out that related to a printed circuit board manufacturing facility in the area. But from an Irish perspective, I would have thought that we had no heavy metal problem and that frankly, following EU directives mm -hmm. in an area where we don't have a problem is frankly nonsensical. Mm -hmm. The second comment I'd make, and if you could throw up the slide, it was about five slides back. You showed, uh, sorry, yeah, go on, next one, please. Yeah, that one there. If we're looking there, if I'm reading that correctly, you're taking the most efficient of your solutions is producing electricity at 26 cents a kilowatt hour or 260 euros a megawatt hour. Now, frankly, you know, that is f four times the marginal cost of electricity generation. And on those basis of those sums, I see no argument for actually putting in a CHP or a power generation facility on site at all. It would be far better to inject the gas into the system in economic terms. Yeah, um, so on, on the first thing, you're right. Like uh, some of the reasons why heavy metals might not be uh, of great uh, importance in some countries or some places is, for instance, is not observed um, in small towns or small cities. When uh, the larger the city is, there is more risks, as far as I know, of contamination or like contamination of industrial wastewater with the, with the normal uh, wastewater, with the urban wastewater. So when there is no risk of that, there is not much impact on, of, of in the quality of the spewage sludge and concerns, that's, that's true. Um, on the second aspect, uh, um, we agree that the opportunities of, of uh, this type of thermal conversion should be going towards more advanced applications that can be or that can fare um, a better in, in uh, within the interests of, of energy energy of the of the country. Um, so, for instance, that's uh, some of our current uh, projects are looking into evaluating the potential of, of biomethane production, so renewable natural gas, national natural gas from available resources, including um, agricultural waste, uh, forestry residues, and all these uh, organic fractions of municipal solid waste. So uh, this type of application for a, small, uh, for a small size can be suitable only to cover, for instance, energy demands of, or, or like heat demands for, for the anaerobic digestion. So very simple systems, only combustion, uh, generating steam, generating energy for the site. Uh, additionally to that, um, this level of, or this order of, of costs for electricity doesn't look, don't look into, uh, for instance, benefits or incentives from the energy sector for the, um, the injection, no injection, or the feeding this electricity into the grid. It doesn't look as well to um, um, uh, receiving money for, for the heat that is recovered. So like, there is a lot of, of heat uh, that is, can be generated in this, but that cannot be actually completely used for the configuration of, of for instance, the uh, heat, uh, heating district systems in, in Ireland. So there is a lot of limitations for these applications and it needs to be looked uh, within, the, within some of the local demands or the specific demands of the site. Um, hello, yeah, hi, uh, t Tom Bruton, uh, energy consultant and uh, ch chartered engineer, uh, I suppose, here. Um, no, the, 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 the question actually I, I, I had, or I was interested in, was the, the, this concept of energy equivalence. And 
uh, slightly related to Jerry's question is, well, was all of your sizing based around self-consumption or auto-consumption and, and not the possibility of uh, exporting power to the grid and exporting heat uh, via district heating network? So, for instance, the uh, exporting heat to uh, district systems was not considered. Um, I guess that's that's very uh, dependent on, on where the plants are located, and that wasn't uh, looked into at that level of analysis that we were uh, considering. But it is it is important on making making profitable the system. Um, again, uh, we did not consider uh, benefits from uh, integrated the power to the grid. We just uh, looked into overcoming the, the footprint of the energy on of the operation. But it's important as well in considering in designing the system and see its profi profitability, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, okay, thank you. But I, I think in fairness, like then the, the price would be the self-consumption price rather than the export price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which could, 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 could be uh, <laughs> not, not as bad as you state, Jerry, but <laughs> still pretty uh, challenging. Thanks very much for everybody for, for showing up tonight on, a, I suppose, a, a cold night. That's the, the last of our lectures, as I said, for this this season. Our next lecture will be in October. And um, again, thank you very much for everyone dialing in at, at home. So listen, just if we wrap it up, Carl, thanks a million for the, the presentation. It was fascinating stuff going on there. And listen, if we can all show our appreciation to Carla for coming up and presenting, that'd be great. <laughs>